Uh, thank you all so much for being here today for an incredibly important event, our Champions of Change on Advancing Prevention, Treatment, and Recovery. I first just want to start by introducing myself. My name is Bess Evans. I manage our health and healthcare portfolio in the Office of Public Engagement in the Domestic Policy Council. But I really want to start by saying thank you. And I think all of you will hear that quite a bit today, um, especially to our incredible 10 Champions of Change that we will be honoring during this program, but to all of you who have spent years sometimes a career's worth of work, um, really dedicating yourself to these principles. And so we just, I want to take a moment to give all of you in this room a round of applause. As folks probably know, we are live streaming today's event. We are live at whitehouse.gov backslash live. So if everyone could take out their cell phones and turn them to silent, just so we don't hear your Taylor Swift ringtone over and over again. And for those of you that have never been to the White House before, our emergency exits are right here and right here, which I'm legally required to tell you. Um, I am very excited to kick off today's um, incredible event by introducing uh, one of the fiercest advocates for the work that we all do in advancing uh, prevention, recovery, and treatment, um, and has been a cornerstone of the work that we do as an administration on making sure that we are addressing the opioid misuse and heroin epidemics uh, that are ravaging our communities across the country. I am just honored to introduce uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary Sil Sylvia Matthews Burwell. Good afternoon and welcome to the White House. One of the most important parts of my job is to visit the communities beyond Washington and to learn from the people that we all serve. And since I started my service as secretary, I've made it a point to learn from communities about how they're fighting the opioid epidemic. I've met the mayors and city council members who are trying the best policy responses. I've had a chance to meet families helping a brother or a sister, a son or a daughter who are fighting the battle against opioid addiction. I've met the families grieving someone who has lost that battle. And I've met the survivors who've made it back from the brink of opioid overdose, many of whom have dedicated their lives now to saving others from addiction and overdose. And as many of you all know so well, this issue is a top priority for this administration, but it's also one that's touched my life personally. I grew up in Hinton, West Virginia, and my home state has consistently ranked at the top of the states with the highest rate of deaths from overdose and have seen the devastation personally in terms of friends in my community that I have lost. But despite our losses, I find hope in this room, and that's why we're all here today. With the help of many of you all, Today, we've made important progress in our fight, and we're going to make more. Each of you has your own story, and I wish we could take the time to talk about each of these stories and about how each one of our 10 champions of change have lifted up their community and the work in their community and the individuals in their community. But today, uh, I will highlight a couple three of these champions who come to us today from different communities and different backgrounds, but bound together by a commitment to this fight. Justin Phillips, the founder of Overdose Lifeline in Indiana, lost her son Aaron from an overdose when he was just 20. In the midst of this loss, Justin dedicated her life to creating what she calls a place of hope. Today, Overdose Lifeline works to raise awareness about the dangers of heroin, reduce the stigma of addiction, and support the families who are fighting this epidemic. And Justin and Overdose Lifeline have been very, very busy. Last year, they worked with Indiana legislators to pass a bill ensuring that more family members and friends of people addicted to opioids can have the life-saving drug naloxone. The law, which was signed by the governor last April, is called Aaron's Law. Leslie Hayes is a family physician at El Centro Family Health in Española, New Mexico. In her community, Leslie educates local officials about the benefits of buprenorphine for opioid addiction treatment. And she quite, has quite literally reached out to as many patients as possible. She offers clinical services to the maximum allowable 100 patients on buprenorphine treatment. 
And almost all of these patients are actually expecting moms. And finally, Chief Leonard Campanello, the Chief of Police in Gloucester, Mass, is here with us today. When he saw the impact of opioids in his community, Chief Campanella decided that communities should stop arresting people with addiction and start assisting them. He established the Gloucester Addiction Initiative, and today, when people walk into a Gloucester police station asking for help with an opioid addiction, help is actually what they get. Each of us here has had experiences that have changed us, that made us realize the cost of inaction and the cost of inertia. For many, it was a series of long hours and difficult days, but today just isn't about the problem. You all are here because your stories are stories of hope and stories of triumph. We need more of these triumphs. We need your best ideas and your innovations to be shared between and across communities in this entire country. Because today we lose too many of our fellow Americans to drug overdoses. As all of you know, since 1999, deaths from opioid overdoses have quadrupled. In this administration, our priority is to reduce prescription, prescription opioid and heroin addiction, overdose, and death. We're working towards that goal with a three-part strategy. First, we're giving health professionals the tools and information they need to make informed prescribing decisions and to help reduce opioid overprescribing. Second, we're making sure more people can have access and use naloxone to save more lives. And finally, we're expanding access to medication assisted treatment, or MAT, for opioid addiction. We're making progress every day toward these goals, but our work can only be successful with your help. You're here because you all are the champions in your communities who can keep our collective progress going. Whether you're here in the room or watching online, we need you to edu educate your communities about opioid addiction and the services that are available to treat it and help people recover. If you're a healthcare provider, we need you to adopt the opioid prescriber guideline issued by CDC in March. We believe this guideline can help you find alternative pain therapies for your patients, limit the dosage and duration of opioids you prescribe, and monitor your patients who need prescription opioids to manage their pain. And you all can start getting involved right away Tomorrow, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Office of Personnel Management, and our Office of National Drug Control Policy are hosting a national drug take-back program across the country to make sure prescription drugs are disposed of safely. You can visit the DEA's website or find a drop -off to find a drop-off location near you. I want to close by recognizing the progress that we are making together. The numbers are staggering and the statistics are sometimes numbing, so it can be difficult to directly see how our work helps a single person wrestling with addiction. Last October, I met one of those people right in my home state when President Obama and I participated in a community forum on opioids. The young man who introduced the president, Jordan Coughlin, grew up in an average middle class family and raised by great parents, but one day, he traded two CDs for six prescription painkillers, and that exchange started a long and dark path to opioid abuse. At one point, an accidental overdose sent him into a coma for nearly five days. For Jordan, it was actually the health of a loved one that shocked him into the path of recovery. When his father, father had a health scare after a minor operation, Jordan knew he had to take his own health more seriously. He started the hard work of long-term recovery. Today, he helps others find that path as a peer recovery specialist, and he's working towards his master's in social work. He later said the only reason he's here today, the reason he can help others today, is that treatment is effective and recovery does happen. He's right. Recovery does happen, and thanks in large part to you all and the work that you do. Thanks to your work, millions of Americans have another chance at recovery, another chance at life. Families and communities across our country have another chance to help a brother, a sister, a son or a daughter triumph over addiction. These successes don't make our losses any easier, but they remind us why it is so important to keep moving forward. 
So thank you for all that you all do, and we're going to continue to make progress. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Burwell. I'm now really honored, as Secretary Burwell just mentioned, um, stories are at the foundation of so much of the work that we all do on this topic. And I am so honored to introduce the person that I credit as the story behind how I became passionate about this. Uh, director Michael Botticelli is the director of National Drug Control Policy, and he shares his story with courage and with strength and with honesty and with the passion that makes it so contagious to others that you can't help but become an advocate for the thousands that are being impacted by opioid misuse and abuse and the heroin epidemic and substance use disorder. Um, he has inspired me. He has inspired so many of the people here at the White House, and I think so many of the folks in this audience. Um, it's almost embarrassing that I'm introducing him because I think you all know him. Um, so we'll ask Director Botticelli to come on up. Thank you, Bess, for that introduction. And good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the White House. Um, and I don't say that lightly. Um, I still am amazed that I get the opportunity to be here and to do this work with so many uh, dedicated federal colleagues. And I really want to thank you all. And f uh, foremost, congratulations to our Champions of Change for advocating prevention, treatment, and recovery nationwide. I think you know that today's event is the culmination of years of work on the parts of our champions. That, you know, this is something that I've had the privilege to observe and experience firsthand. As Beth said, you know, I've had the privilege of being in recovery for over 27 years, and it was champions in my life who got me to the place I am today. So I really want to thank you all, not only for the champions of the work that you're doing, but all the people that came before you to make this event and this movement possible. You know, since I became the director, I've had the privilege of traveling around the country, talking with people about their struggles with substance use, and seeing the innovative solutions and the compassion and the humanity and the ideas being used to address it, many of which are led by the champions here. Over the past six months, I've held community forums and roundtable discussions all across this country, St states like West Virginia, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Ohio, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania. And what I've seen and heard has confirmed my belief that both federal policy and community innovations are critical to changing how we treat people with substance use disorders and how we think about them. Change, we know, requires leadership. It requires innovation and engaging stakeholders, policymakers, private sector leaders at every level of government and across all private and public sectors. Change requires building key leaderships between public health and law enforcement agencies. In short, it requires change dedicated champions, and that's how we're going to move our country forward from crisis to recovery. These champions and other incredible leaders like them around the country, they don't do it for recognition. They certainly don't do it for the money. But they make an incredible difference in all of our lives. And today we're going to hear from two panels of champions, the first discussing innovative efforts to end the opioid epidemic, and the second Discussing, uh, discussing our champions' stories of recovery and how they are turning their experience into action. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for the work that you do every day. And please join me in welcoming our first panel to the stage. Thank you, everybody. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chris Jens. I'm the director of the Division of Science Policy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at HHS. Uh, and as a researcher who has dedicated much of my professional life to this issue, it is really an honor to be here with each of you today who are implementing innovative strategies in your communities. But <clears throat> from a personal perspective as a person in long-term recovery, it's, it's really inspiring 
to see the work that you're doing to engage with the community of people who have addiction and who need compassion and care and access to treatment. Um, <clears throat> so it's really an honor, both professionally and personally, to be working on this issue as well as engaging with you today. Um, as we get started, I wanted to just to open it up to each of you to talk about why you've made the work that you're doing a priority. You know the statistics, you know how this is impacting communities, and out of all the other things that might be grabbing, trying to grab your attention, why is this a priority? And what are the specific steps that you and your organizations are taking to improve the lives of Americans? And I'll just, whoever wants to go first. My guess is the chief is gonna go first. <laughs> Uh, well, our initiative in Gloucester was community driven under the leadership of our mayor, uh, Safathia Romeo Taken, who's in the audience tonight, and Representative Ann Margaret Ferrante. And um, we simply listened to the community who did not want um, people suffering from addiction to be further um, stigmatized by arrest and incarceration. And what we had seen was a failed war on drugs, which was actually a war on addiction, it seemed like. Um, over the last 50 or 60 years. So um, we were charged with a different way of doing things, and, and the way was to treat the illness with dignity, uh, compassion, professionalism, and to try to help, to try to be a gateway to treatment. And uh, that's what the community charged us with, and that's what we did 11 months ago. Um, I work in Española, New Mexico, which, similar to Hinton, West Virginia, often is number one in the country for opiate overdoses many years. And about 10 years ago, I just happened to stumble into prescribing buprenorphine. And I was working with Project ECHO at the time, which is this great organization um, founded by a hepatologist who was trying to improve treatment of hepatitis C, because he realized he would never be able to treat all the hepatitis C. So he started training primary care providers to treat um, hepatitis C across the state of New Mexico. And then from there, they decided, we'll get people prescribing buprenorphine. So I went through the first buprenorphine training, and I really didn't think about what it would mean to be the only physician in the, a county with very, very high rate of overdoses. And it was so exciting because suddenly I had something I could do. Up until that time, these people came into my office. They said, I'd like to quit. And I said, that'd be great. And then they left and they continued to use. And all of a sudden, I had something that I personally could do. And we realized it was making a difference. And then about five, seven years ago, it started becoming acceptable to treat pregnant women with these medications. And so at this time, we had three or four of us in the office doing it. And we started treating pregnant women. And that was where we realized we were really changing lives. Because um, pregnant women who use drugs are often viewed in the media. As people who don't care, how could anyone use drugs when they're pregnant? They're damaging their babies. But what I found was these women did not want to be using drugs. They desperately wanted to get into recovery. They wanted to be safe. They wanted to you know, take care of their baby. They wanted to be able to raise their baby after their baby was born. And so we started prescribing the buprenorphine um, during pregnancy and referring them for methadone if needed, referring them for inpatient. And all of a sudden, these women were having healthy babies. They were staying drug free after they deliver. Um, and even the ones who did not do well in the program, and certainly I wish I could say we were universally successful at getting them all off drugs, but what we found is the ones who were not successful, we would identified them ahead of time. So we were doing the extra testing to make sure that their babies were healthy. We were um, taking care of um, making sure that they were getting adequate nutrition. And we also helped identify who's going to take care of your baby after your baby is born, because that was something that was really important. Up until that time, it seemed like we'd have somebody come in once a month with no prenatal care. They'd deliver CYFD, would swoop and take the baby, and that was that. And it was awful. It was traumatic for the families. It was traumatic for the medical personnel. And now they'd come in. They'd know we were going to notify CYFD. But their aunt had said, I'm going to take this baby. I will raise this baby. And it just, it was incredible and it was so much a better way to go. Many of them were able to take the babies home. These women, I swear, have the longest breastfeeding duration of anyone in my practice. I have many who are, babies are two and three and they're still breastfeeding because these are such loving moms if they're able to take care of their babies. And it's, it's funny because I talk to people and they, they think I'm some kind of saint for doing this, but really this is what saved me because this is so fun to actually be able to make a difference here, so. So I'm from Connecticut, uh, but originally from Massachusetts, so I love hearing the chief speaking in my native tongue. <laughs> uh, 
So I work for a statewide AIDS organization, and uh, three years ago we worked to change legislation to make it easier for prescribers to write prescriptions for naloxone um, and make it more accessible to families and friends. Um, and we sat around a table, and I said, well, who's leading the way on, the, on this? Who's, who's promoting this? And it was crickets. Nobody was. So we, I took the stand and formed a statewide um, opiate overdose prevention work group. We got buy-in from all the relevant state departments um, around the table. We have treatment providers. We work with researchers from Yale. Um, we have prescribers. We have affected family members. Um, and our main goals over the last three years were to increase awareness about naloxone and increase access to naloxone. Um, and that's happening slowly um, in the state. Our State Department of Public Health was able to purchase naloxone. I, I, God knows where they found the money. I think they were looking under rocks and, and abandoned closets for it. But they managed to purchase uh, quite a bit of naloxone and distribute it to the programs that have syringe exchange programs, which we do. Um, we were the first community-based organization to start doing community distribution of naloxone with our syringe service clients. That was about a year and a little bit ago. And over that period of time, our clients have been able to uh, reverse over 70 overdoses just out in the community. Um, so our work is continuing forward. Um, Governor Malloy, uh, we passed a very comprehensive piece of legislation last year um, that puts uh, continuing uh, medication credits for, or continuing uh, credits for prescribers and safely prescribing opiates and pain management, um, allowed uh, pharmacists to go online and get certified to prescribe and dispense naloxone, and put some more um, teeth in our prescription drug monitoring program. That all passed last year. That's been rolling out. And this year, there's another comprehensive piece of legislation um, that's going to address even some additional, additional issues um, to really address some of the um, access to naloxone, uh, but also to make sure that um, you know, people have access to treatment as well. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Andre Johnson, and I'm a person in long-term recovery myself, and that means I have not used no drugs and alcohol in nearly 28 years. And if it wasn't, <laughs> and 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 so what really motivates me and brings me here today is for personal reasons as well as professional reasons. Number one, being a person in long-term recovery, I realized firsthand how I was just one drug away from overdosing or one drug away from being killed because of my addiction. Um, professionally, I've been involved and, and have been affiliated with the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration and Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Prevention, and a number of faces and voices of recovery, national organizations here in D.C., uh, I recognize that this is not just a Detroit problem. This is a, a global problem. Um, and, and I've learned so much in terms of why it's important that we advance treatment, prevention, and recovery in our nation. Um, I founded a peer-led, peer-ran, peer-driven organization just a little over 10 years ago. And when we started this recovery community support program, we found people walking through our doors with a variety of backgrounds as it relates to drug usage. And we also found that we worked with our um, Wayne County uh, coroner's office and discovered that we had somewhere between 75 to 100 deaths of drug overdose in the Detroit Wayne County area. I mean, so when we talk about epidemic, we're talking about people are dying by the dozens every day. And I think, realistically, we, we don't do enough of this. And so I'm, I'm really thankful and grateful that we have our, our drugs out here, um, Michael. Um, but I, I kind of, how you doing? And just, just, 
this, this whole effort for me is really important because we have to increase our awareness in our community and people still don't believe that it can happen to them. People still don't believe that it's possible and we can never do enough in our country and our communities to really promote the message that recovery is possible, that prevention works. And I'm happy to see Justin, a young, young man here out of Denver, Colorado where they're making billions of dollars selling weed for medicinal purposes. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the truth of the matter is we, we realize that um, drugs is a problem in all of our communities. It doesn't discriminate against um, the suburban community, the rural community, or how much money you have in your pocket. It does not matter. Um, we have a team of peers in Detroit that, that work day in, day out to help people sustain long-term recovery. We discovered that a number, we had these very high recidivism rates, meaning people were leaving out of treatment and relapsing within the first 30 days. And then we looked at these people were leaving out of treatment and they didn't really have a lot of resources in the community. Uh, and so they returned right back into that, into that drug infested environment or community that's non-supportive in some cases. And that's how the Detroit Recovery Project emerged. We said we will be that safety net in the community. We will be that organization to hold your hands the moment you complete treatment. We also hold people's hands during the whole process of um, receiving methadone maintenance treatment. We hold people's hands who are receiving buprenorphine treatment and a number of other uh, Medicaid assisted therapy programs. We believe we embrace the whole many pathways to recovery process and we try to help people along that recovery process because we know that recovery is nonlinear. There's no special way, there's no one way fits all. It's many pathways to recovery and that's what the Detroit Recovery Project embraces and we embrace everybody, all walks of life and we're telling folks you can achieve long-term recovery and it's possible. Why? It's because I've achieved long-term recovery. And then lastly, I just want to say that our organization has, you know, as we, or as I sit here as a champion of change, um, it's more indicative of the people that I've been involved with. It's more indicative of the staff that work every day and every night for the Detroit Recovery Project. Our government, our Detroit City Council, our board, our, our board members that uh, help to found the organization, our city mayor's office, our state legislature, um, who I'm proud to say that we have one of our uh, state senators here in our audience today, uh, Mr. Bert Johnson, um, and a number of local and federal and county support and then the entire prevention treatment recovery community has supported our organization. So I, I cannot say it enough that we, we are only effective as we are as it relates to working together collectively for the greater cause. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Julio Medina. Um, just feels wonderful to be here. Um, so I look at this work from, from the lens of criminal justice. And, and for me, I kind of accidentally stumbled upon this because uh, I was on the opposite side. I was in handcuffs when, when Chief was, was arresting people. Um, I served 12 years in uh, New York State Prison um, for substance abuse and trafficking. Um, and I think for me, there was a wake up call when I was locked up. And that wake up call is when you become conscious in this process. We don't realize in, in many of our communities, at least some of our inner city, inner city communities, there seems like the only economic engine at that time was this trade, which was the substance abuse trade. It, it didn't feel like there was anything else available to a young man growing up in poverty. Um, and I think one of the things, and hopefully you don't, you don't chase me off and realize I'm really not a champion of change, is, is the when you become conscious, you go back and think of the disgust of the work that you did. And for me, the disgust and the most shameful point was making certain on the 1st and the 16th there was enough drugs available in our communities. 
And I say that was the lowest point for me to now say, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm the problem here. I'm the one destroying our communities. Um, and I started looking at it through, through this lens and recognizing how many people, and we went around in the prison saying, what are you here for? I was getting high. What are you here for? I was getting high and I, and I did a robbery. What are you here for? I was getting high and I, I, you know, everything related back. And we looked at some of the statistics and we're talking 85% of people throughout this country are incarcerated for a criminal justice offense, for a substance abuse offense. Uh, of that, 65% are diagnosed with a substance abuse history. 11% actually get treatment. Something was wrong with that picture. So for us it was we have to do something about it. Um, we were eventually released. Um, I got a, a, a great team together. Um, Fred Davey, my mentor, was one of the first people who, who trusted in, in the work that we did when I was released. Uh, uh, Katina, one of our board members, and Diana Ortiz, my associate director, we kind of, when this work started and when we thought about it, we said there's some opportunity that we can make a difference in New York and maybe throughout the country. And our goal was a holistic approach um, to someone being released and making certain that they don't go back into that same lifestyle. So at Exodus, I'm, the, I'm fortunate to be the, the founder and executive director of Exodus Transitional Community, which is a, a nonprofit in East Harlem, uh, Newburgh and Poughkeepsie. Um, we are in areas where we're supposed to be. Geographically, we are in the lowest income uh, areas with the highest crime rates, substance abuse rates, um, with economic poverty throughout, um, and we wouldn't have it any other way. Um, we have, we work with people from 16 on parole or probation to 70 who served 30 years in prison. Our goal at Exodus is to make certain that no one goes back, no one recidivates, no one uh, 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 picks up another drug again. Um, we try to create a pathway for new beginnings, for new opportunities for people being released. Um, and just as a country, I mean, we, we, we seem to be turning the tide, but I think one of the things we, you know, we want to realize, at least in New York, you know, after the Rockefeller drug laws, we, just, we, we cannot incarcerate our way out of this problem. Um, we all know that uh, in New York we're doing some work. We, we realize some of the costs, $200,000 a year to lock up someone on, in Rikers Island, which is our city jail. $200,000 for one year to lock someone up. And our state facilities is $60,000. As Americans, as human beings, we could do better. <laughs> I mean, this is not, this is not uh, rocket scientists. I think we could all figure this out. There has to be some better alternatives, some better solutions. We can reduce the prison population by half um, if we just look at some of those nonviolent crimes and, and, and look at how many of them were substance abuse related and, and begin to minimize some of those sentences. We saw it happen in, in, in California under, under Prop 47, which, which was able to change six felony laws and declassify them into misdemeanors, with, which now allowed people who had double life sentences for, for a, a sale of a $10 sale of heroin to now kind of come back and be productive people in the community. So it's, it's a, again, a wonderful opportunity. I, I, I come to this work, like I said, from, from the other end. Uh, I saw the damage that was committed, and for us it's a lifetime commitment to make certain we can, we can do something about it and, and, and turn the tide. So that's our, our mission, and, and what an honor it is to be here amongst uh, the other champions, and, and, and it's, it's really a privilege. So thank you. So as Secretary Burwell mentioned in her remarks, change really happens at the community level. We can put out best practices at the federal level, we can put out funding and technical assistance, but the people on the ground are really creating the change. And I think each of you reflected in your own circumstances that there was a spark and you had to build a coalition of people who could help support and facilitate the work. So I think if, if a few of you want to sort of talk, take that point from you had this idea how did you get the right people at the table? Because I think there are a lot of people who say, 
bad things are happening in our community, too many people are dying, I don't know what to do. I want to do something. And so talk through that process of how did you build the, to the tipping point of creating what you have today. And we're not going in a straight line. <laughs> I, won't, I won't allow it. I don't mind. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, um, one of the things I was able to do was really to understand our, our local community leaders that, that had a shared interest in, in what it was that we were proposing to do, which was ultimately create a vital program to help people, in re help one, help people sustain long-term recovery, and two, make sure we are available for those who need it. And so, I mean, so it made sense for me to reach out to the faith-based community. I reached out to a number of um, pastors in the Detroit area. I reached out to a number of elected officials, whether it was city government, county government, state, um, et cetera. And I would also reach out to the community leaders. And, and I think it's important to know who your community leaders are and who has the same shared interests and how you can work together, not work together collectively. And I think that's always the hard part, is making sure you can bring the right people at the table where it's non-competitiveness, or in some cases, um, sometimes people come to the table for the wrong reasons. So, but I think partnership building, coalition building, and being able to have clear objectives, uh, clear, clear goals and objectives, and an agenda. And it can be done in any community, but I find it really, really important that the community approach works well. I mean, the beauty of Office of National Drug Control Policy and SAMHSA is that they always have materials on the website that you can glean from and share with the rest of the world. I think a lot of people may not necessarily be aware that there are a lot of tips and handouts that we can share in our community to educate people about the best practices, models that's going on. There's a number of advocates that's always seeking opportunity to come into the communities and talk. We had, we had Tom Hill um, in Detroit 10 years ago, and he was walking, you know, he flew in from D.C. Green to the city of Detroit, and he walking through the belly of the beast like he was in Washington, D.C. I told him, <laughs> you can't walk in that area. <laughs> <laughs> it's not safe, Tom, <laughs> but, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's really teaching people where you are, what's really going on, and people need to be taught, and I don't think we can do enough of this. We need more, pro you know, we reached out to our public schools, we started partnering with several high schools and teaching kids about the dangers of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. We start, when we start partnering with the churches, we start have an outreach in the church. We start having outreach in the community. We will go set up shop on a, on a corner where we know drugs are being sold, prostitution is occurring, and we will have four and five tables, and we'll have 25 peers from our community, and we would do HIV rapid testing. We would do drug on the site uh, alcohol drug screening. I'm talking about really grassroots type stuff, like rolling your sleeves up and being comfortable in your own community, in your own neighborhood. We have to reclaim our community. We have to reclaim our neighborhood. And it's our, it's our job to say not in my backyard. Well, as I mentioned three years ago, a statute changed to make it easier to prescribe naloxone. And um, on one level, it was easy to pull that coalition together because we were already working with the Department of Public Health. Um, through their division of HIV. They al also oversee the syringe exchange programs. We had colleagues at Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services who were working on this as well. Um, Department of Children and Families have joined the table. Department of Corrections, our state troopers, all carry naloxone and they report to the Department of Corrections. The medical director there is incredibly forward thinking, uh, Dr. Kathleen Maurer. Um, and we've had Department of Consumer Protection there. And as I mentioned, some of the other partners, uh, prescribers, researchers for male, we had old data on opiate overdose death data in the state only up to 2007. And all I had to do was pick up the phone and call Dr. Loretta Grau and say, Loretta, what would it take for you and Skip to update all the OD data? And she said, let me call over to the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. And so we uh, used an intern, I participated, and we went through every single overdose, um, opiate-involved overdose death over the last five years. 
um, and really clean that data. And we coded every single substance that people found in the tox reports. Um, and then Loretta and Skip analyzed the data, created geospatial maps, and that gave us some really great tools to push forward more public policy um, on the need for naloxone, on the need for safely prescribing opiates, which ultimately led to the governor's bill um, last session. And because our group has continued to meet, um, you know, as things come up, we're able to address them um, in a really sort of cohesive, comprehensive way. I actually had it kind of easy as far as getting it started in my community because first off, the need was so very obvious to many people. And then secondly, there was already a program, the Project ECHO, as far as training people and getting people started on it. Um, Project ECHO, like I said, was initially started to treat hepatitis C and it's a program that consists of some initial training in many, many different areas of medicine. In this particular case, it was initial training in um, prescribing buprenorphine and then case presentations once a week and the availability of a specialist to call and get help. And um, I got enough experience rapidly that I actually started training other physicians. And once I started training other physicians, the other physicians in my community, many of them looked and said, yeah, I want to be able to help here. And then the rest said, no, we're not going to do it. And I, I must admit, I've not made great progress with them. But um, one thing that we found really helpful was um, we found we couldn't just train the people who are actually doing the prescribing for the buprenorphine. Um, we had to train everybody in the community. So we made sure that we got the community health workers, the nursing staff, um, all of the counselors, sometimes front desk staff. We, we tried to bring in everybody to make sure everybody understood what we were doing in the medical community because um, it doesn't do any good to have a physician trained to do this if the nursing staff doesn't want to deal with them, if the front desk staff is rude to them. So um, I found that explaining to people how important this was and that it worked, that it really did make a difference, has made a huge difference. And so um, you want to look at everybody, not just the people who are in charge, I think is one thing that's really important. So uh, to the chief, I want to ask you a question that I think in some ways you make be the unexpected messenger on the approach that you're taking and how do you or how did you navigate that among your force and in your community to to really change the paradigm of the interaction between police and people who are using substances and what advice would you have for others who may be facing similar institutional barriers or stigma that you likely faced so that's a deep question. <laughs> so I'll try to give you a deep answer. Although my majors were not in psychology in, in, in college. Um, first off, um, despite whatever programs run or whatever um, initiatives are started, I think anywhere, I think there has to be a philosophical change, certainly in law enforcement. Um, I don't, I don't consider myself a champion of anything, um, and certainly not deserving of, of this recognition as an individual, or uh, in, in fact, very uncomfortable with it, uh, as I'm sure that um, my colleagues to some degree are as well. The reason for that is because per personally and professionally, uh, there's a duality in law enforcement. Um, when you put on the uniform, um, there's a self-expectation, there's an expectation from the public that you perform perfectly, that you have no flaws, and that you don't, um, you don't make mistakes. And the reality is, is that I'm probably uh, at least in the top ten of flawed people in this room, <laughs> and if, if not in the top three. And, and that realization and that sort of uh, you know, leads to, if you're any type of introspective person, a self-stigmatization and a self-shamefulness. Uh, and I think that that was used in identifying with the addicted people. And so when this, when this change was demanded from the community, um, there was a struggle between the professional who was saying, no, our role in society is to arrest people who break the law, and one of those laws being illegal possession of a narcotic. And, you know, growing up personally as a flawed person who uh, 
you know, deserves compassion and should show it to other people, especially in our role in law enforcement. Uh, there's no achievement in that. There's only responsibility, and not just for law enforcement, but I think for all of us in this room and certainly around the country. So, um, so when the idea was presented, there was that struggle. And um, I think the right thing, one, is, is that uh, we need to start looking at each other, especially from the law enforcement side, as not separate. Uh, you know, not even as, I know the new word is guardians. I don't even like that word. <laughs> Uh, you know, what are we guarding? Um, I, I just think um, we're in a position to help, and we should realize the positions that we've been in in our past that need to be helped and, and try to do that as well when we uh, look at addiction. And this is a question for Dr. Hayes but I'll wait till she gets done talking. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think from your perspective as a physician, um, when you look at buprenorphine in particular, the Data 2000 law has been in place for over a decade. You have about 32,000 doctors who've requested a waiver of about 900,000. And I think there, you know, there certainly are issues with capacity um, to provide the treatment and willingness, as you said, even in your community, some people were willing and some were not. And I think what we hear from many clinicians, especially who are not specialists, but are primary care docs who you know, somehow get involved in, in whether it's a particular patient or just an interest in the issue, is that it's very rewarding, you know, once you take that. And I think there's the perception that it's just a, the barrier to entering and engaging with this patient population will just overrun your primary care practice. And I think, what, what's your perspective on, you know, did you feel those things? How did you navigate that? How have you managed? I mean, you're treating at the top end of what's currently allowed, and how have you managed to do that successfully in the context of maintaining your practice? It definitely can get a little overwhelming at times, especially, I feel like if all of the primary care providers in my community would take on, you know, some of these patients, then none of us would be overwhelmed, but for right now, it, it is an issue. Um, one thing I've always said, I love NA and AA, but I think one of the detrimental things they've done is there's this often an attitude that only someone who has been through addiction can treat addictions. And for many years, this allowed physicians off the hook. Oh, well, you know, I have no history of addiction, so I can't deal with these people. And then the second thing I think is we tend, because we're not screening well for addiction, we tend to only see people addiction in people who have really severe addictions, the alcoholic with end-stage cirrhosis, the guy who comes in with huge abscesses, the one who's overdosing twice a week and ending up in the ER. Um, we as primary care physicians are not often diagnosing the guy who's maybe taking Percocet on the weekend or, you know, drinking six beers a night to try and cope with things. And those are the folks we need to start doing. And that's one thing I really think that we need as a medical community um, to be advocating for is that people do diagnose um, substance use disorder much, much earlier because it is so much easier to treat and actually much more rewarding to treat if we can diagnose it earlier. And. One of the things I've taken to saying when people tell me, well, I don't want to treat those people because I don't want them in, their, in my waiting room, is they're already in your waiting room. You're just not identifying and treating them. So, so. And the family practice residencies, both in Albuquerque and Santa Fe, have now made it one of their goals to have all of their residents leaving knowing how to prescribe buprenorphine. So we have done buprenorphine trainings for their residents every year for the last four or five years. And um, they also insisted that all of their attendings get training in buprenorphine. Some of them have been more enthused than others, I will say. But um, I think we need to convince the national organizations, the American Academy of Family Practitioners, um, the American College of Physicians, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, that this is part of primary care. This is a very, very common condition. It is treatable by things physicians can do in their office. I see no reason that physicians are not treating this. And there are things that only physicians can do. I mean, physicians are the only people who can treat with buprenorphine. And so we need to have it be considered part of mainstream medicine. And I think that's what we need to work on, so. So as we wrap up the panel, I want to give everybody an opportunity to really just say, what's your 
one, if you had one opportunity, one thing to say to folks who are your peer cohort, you know, wanting to do the things that match up with what you do, what would that be? And we'll start with you. Sure. Um, we got to stop criminalizing addiction. Addiction is not a, a, a criminal activity. And for me, it's we can save uh, states and in, in our country, uh, uh, and taxpayer in particular, <laughs> a lot of money if we just got smarter. So let's stop criminalizing uh, addiction. <laughs> Make naloxone available over the counter. We have to remove barriers to access to naloxone. The stigma around substance use, particularly opiate use, makes it incredibly difficult for families to go to their family physician to ask for a prescription or even to go to a pharmacist and ask for a prescription. It needs to be over the counter. It's safer than aspirin, EpiPens, or an antibiotic. So let's just make it safe and available to everybody. I would tell my cohort, just do it. It's, it's worth doing. It's rewarding. They should do it. And if I could make one plea to all the policymakers in the room, please make it so that physician assistants and nurse practitioners can do this. <laughs> there are nurse practitioners prescribing huge amounts of Oxycontin, but they cannot prescribe buprenorphine. It is just a crazy dichotomy, and I think we need to change that law. Uh, taking the bold move of addressing law enforcement in the country is if you continue to do what you do, you're going to continue to get the same results, which is death, stigmatization, and more and more people addicted. Um, we don't work for insurance companies. We don't work for pharmaceuticals who would rather see people dead or incarcerated than in treatment. So let's address the real problem on both sides of the issue and listen to your community. After all, it is who you serve. And if you're a police leader, that's your only role. That's the only people you work for is your community. So listen to what they're telling you, that they don't want their addicted person further stigmatized by an arrest. They have enough problems. Let's try to help. Chris, I'm going to need 10 minutes, okay? No, just me. <laughs> now, I, I think, uh, oh, Stephanie, I know she's <laughs> the bullhorn over there. Uh, no, seriously, I think that we need to ex explore um, be more creative with developing more partnerships. Specifically, I think more foundations, more corporations. I think not just really asking money from the federal government, but looking at how we can begin to redistribute resources that can really increase awareness in our community. I think we need to have this conversation in every community, in every living room, in every coffee shop. Uh, we need to have this conversation about what's really going on in our community, and the only way we're going to make a change is if we begin to talk about it, because change starts with the individual first, and then one person can help change the whole community. I mean, this room, we should have the whole White House filled up. We should have, I mean, we was in here talking about ISIS when we, we you know, we wouldn't be able to get out of here, right? But we, so I think, you know, and community awareness is important. One of the things we were doing was um, prescription day, take back prescription day, where we encouraged everybody to go into your medicine cabinet and take out those old pills outside of your, your, your medicine cabinet. And we did that several times. And we looked up, we had a couple hundred pounds of medication. Um, you know, it's just, we got to keep doing community awareness. And I think that's where it starts. And on all levels, federal, um, going down to the state, county, city, and involving your churches, involving your corporations, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the work that you do. Congratulations uh, for being here today. And thanks for a good conversation. Thank you.